and shape our lives and you know change the world around us for the better. Uh, on the side, I'm also a DIY hacker, so I published one of the world's first open source hacks to the game Guitar Hero, and I built robots that make art. But the only artistic award I've ever won is a Botsker at the Robot Film Festival, so um, I'll leave that to the rest of the panelists here. So Hillary and I have actually known each other for over a decade socially. We met in Baltimore through friends while I was going to grad school, and we stayed in touch. Um, for the last few years. And um, we started working together towards building deepmusic.ai for almost two years now. And it's been really interesting navigating the project between these two different uh, worlds and creating a common shared language and talking about the sensitivities and learning from each other and just realized that this was bigger than just conversations that we were having. And, you know, I really learned a lot from watching Hillary and working with her. She's a person of you know, immense precision and instinct for excellence, um, her commitment through seeing things to the finish. And what I really respect about her is uh, her understanding of other artists and the value she puts on the creative process and really understanding the intent behind everyone and bringing people together. So that's been amazing. So thank you, Hillary, for, for working on this project with me. And over the last few years, um, I've been really interested in the impact of AI on creativity and art. And music and AI has been so intertwined and have deep roots in math. And we really wanted to um, bring AI and the arts together. So AI is a superpower, and I see it as a bridge between the arts and science field. So we're really in excited to introduce this new technology to the world's best artists and see what they could do and what they would create. Yeah, and I wanted to mention about working with you, Carol, since we're we're giving each other compliments, <laughs> which is what I'm going to do right now. Um, I wanted to mention that one thing I'm super impressed by speaking with you is how you see music as a very nuanced field. Um, you understand the arts as something to be approached with sensitivity and not as something just cool to join up with. And I just really, really appreciate the, the deep thought that you give to this project. And also when I mention something that I'm thinking about, about the overlap of these fields, you really do um, listen and consider what that means. So for me as an artist, it's, it's really meaningful when bringing art together with another field that both sides have sensitivity to each other. Um, all right, so I wanted to speak about the program tonight. So if we're gonna quickly, I'm gonna give you a quick uh, rundown of what's gonna happen. So we have three premieres. Uh, the composers will speak a little bit before each one. Um, each composer will speak before their piece and introduce it. And um, we're gonna start with David Lang's piece, Out of Body, which was, um, done with OpenAI's MuseNet, and we're gonna go to uh, Dana's piece, um, Ava, Dana Leong's piece, uh, sorry, I Dragon, written with Ava, and it's a combination, as you'll see in his performance, of self-recorded tracks, and since it's pandemic times and orchestra gatherings are not very possible, um, he combined himself playing four different instruments and then um, synthesized the rest of the orchestra, but you'll get a pretty good idea of what it could sound like um, what the power and drive of it could sound like in in person. So that's kind of fun to imagine as well. And Michael Abels wrote a piece called Gift of the Machine, which will be performed by Dominic Cayley, fantastic pianist who um, recorded at the uh, recorded this piece at the Colburn School at Zipper Hall, which for me is really special because I made a recording in Zipper Hall myself back years ago. So it's it's really kind of bringing everything full circle. And Michael composed his piece um, working with Ava, sort of working with what Ava gave him and um, making it a piece that, that was playable <laughs> on the piano. And so we'll have these pieces and then we'll have a live composers panel where you get to hear the composers actual like thought processes, which I'm really excited about. And then we'll recap the experience of the pieces after you've gotten a little bit more like deeper perspective from that that conversation and from hearing the pieces the first time we'll recap it with all three pieces back to back and um that'll be that and then afterwards everything will be posted to youtube and vimeo so you can share it and uh, revisit it 
So the first piece is David's. It's light moving. That's sorry, not light. <laughs> David, I'm going into old patterns here. Um, <laughs> so David wrote a piece for me for my encores project. I did a commissioned encores project called in 27 pieces. And that piece was light moving. And so, um, that was the first time I worked with David and I got to see how open-minded you are, David, towards other composers. And that is evidenced in everything that you do from the, the bang on a can collective co-founding and, um, continuing it. And from your iconic status as a thinker and, um, composer, I, I'm thinking about all the movie work you've done, but also mostly the, the performance pieces you've written. And, um, you know, of course you have the Pulitzer Grammy stuff, you know, da, 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 da. But, um, I just wanted to mention that I just really appreciate in this piece, the level of thought about the concept of the work. And I tried to reflect that in my performance where I use technique to also indicate certain aspects of what you were writing. And you wrote in three parts. The first part is human written, it's yours. And then the second part is the human in AI. So it's you and the piece, the, the notes that MuseNet gave you in the melody that you selected. And the third section is the um, AI written stuff. And so when it's a human written thing, when it's a David thing, it's a down bow. And when it's a AI note, it's an up bow. So I, that's my little tutorial for the piece. And I'll hand it over to you, David, if you want to talk about how to um, introduce the piece. Yeah, thank you so much, Hillary. It's really great. Um, I did this other piece for you, and I knew that you could play pretty much anything, which was really great. I was very happy. My first conversation was with both of you about this project, both you, Hillary, and you, Carol. And so one of the ways this was presented to me was that both sides should be equal that the human side and the AI side should be equal. And so I tried to think of a way so that I would contribute exactly the same amount of material that the AI would. So I had this idea of writing a piece of music that would be these short kind of chords that had a lot of space in between them. And that would leave room for the AI to be, you know, kind of slotted in between all the things that the violin did. I cheated slightly because I did actually, um, uh, I'm not the most technological person in the world. So I worked with a friend of mine um, who's an excellent um, composer and violinist and also a real tech um, geek, um, Todd Reynolds, who um, helped me be the interface with the technology, which was very helpful. And what I came up with was one piece that I wrote completely straight through with a lot of holes through it. That's the part that's all played down bow. And then the... Um, AI listened to what I did and learned um, kind of the vocabulary of what was going on and generated notes in response to my notes. And then I slotted them together, alternating, but I, um, I sort of made them a little bit um, staggered so that my part starts, then it's both together, and then the AI ends it. And the piece is super short, so um, it's really fun. Have fun.
Ooh, wow. Super interesting. So you'll, you'll, good job, David. Um, you'll also notice, I wanted to point out, I'm sure everyone saw, but each of these three videos has an indicator of what is um, AI composed or AI inspired versus what was uh, human composed. So, so um, for Hillary's, it was this orange and blue um, light indicators. So that was, that was definitely something to watch for. And it was fantastic how clear that was. And I, I love that it alternated notes. Um, our next composer and performer is David Leong. And um, it's, his music really spans multiple genres. He's got two Grammys, one in Latin jazz and one in classical music. So, um, so it just shows like his breadth of skill there. Uh, Dana and I actually met at a World Economics Forum Young Global Leaders event last year, and he was performing the cello and I saw it and I immediately sensed that he was someone who enjoyed working and performing with novel technologies. And I approached him after his performance and asked if he'd ever thought about incorporating AI or, you know, wanting to try it out because I, it's right now at the start of uh, possibly a new field that could emerge as maybe a new genre of music. And um, so when I reached out to him, I, um, he, he was immediately enthusiastic. So I'm going to pass it over to Dana to chat about his piece and talk about the video. And an interesting thing about his video is that he's not only the composer, but also this multi-instrument performer. So you'll see that in the video. Thanks, Carol. Thanks, Hillary. Wow, that was a beautiful piece. I really enjoyed that. The, the rhythm of it and the, the dance that you brought to it was, was uh, phenomenal. Uh, just a wonderful uh, experience to be together here and a new spin on, uh, you know, this virtual premiere uh, kind of realm. Uh, you know, shout out to both of you guys. Uh, I couldn't think of a better powerhouse uh, female leadership duo than, than you two. This is really an honor to be here really, really uh, legendary. You know, uh, I come from a musical family, and so we're very much, uh, uh, we very much, you know, uh, lived and grew with your music, Hillary, uh, for many decades. And uh, it's, it's great to be here together today to share this, and happy holidays, everyone. Uh, so as Carol had mentioned, yes, I am a musician and uh, come from a musical family, and uh, I would say that I'm somebody that is an eternal optimist. So I constantly try and I constantly break technology. Uh, and in this case, uh, you know, same as the first time I ever got a computer, I wanted to see what are the limits, right? So some of the first questions we asked ourselves are, well, uh, if AI is creating music, would it be able to create a piece that has the literary uh, aptitude of uh, Shakespeare? Or would it be able to, you know, take our breath away the way that, uh, you know, seeing the Taj Mahal for the first time would? Uh, unfortunately, the answer is probably still no. But, you know, don't turn the zoom off yet, right? Because, you know, there's a lot of things that the AI actually can do that we've found uh, and we're very proud of. Uh, so what I did with my piece, I Dragon, is I took uh, my orchestral arrangement of a very traditional and popular Hong Kong folk song, uh, called Heirs of the Dragon, and we have a electronic uh, plus symphonic version uh, of that, and we fed that into the AI because we wanted to see if it could actually recognize the style of writing. Because for me, and for a lot of people in the AI industry, we've recognized that AI is very good for two things right now. Uh, being able to do something that's very simple and do a lot of it. For example, if you have a folder, you know, our hard drive full of images, and you said, find all the images of dogs, that AI could go through that hard drive way faster than a human could and find all the pictures of the dogs. Or if uh, you're a musician or composer and you have hard drives full of full of music and you want to say, okay, I only want the music with cello and trombone. I don't want the violin music, no offense, uh, you know, or I don't want the opera music, you know, please find me just the cello and trombone. It would whiz through there, even though most of us have iTunes libraries that may play for years on end, right? So I wanted the AI to be able to recognize what instruments were in the song and help me start to do the building blocks of the orchestration because that is something that's very tedious as a composer to always set up templates, you know, choose the instrumentations, set them up on the screen and then start recording and, and, uh, and composing and or orchestrating. The second thing that the AI is really good at doing is something uh, 
let's see, what do we say? The first one was uh, finding something symbol, doing a lot of it, right? And then, Carol, maybe you could help me out. Do you remember what, what we said the second thing was? <laughs> Let me see. The, the second thing, uh, oh, is being able to do something much more quickly than a human, right? So in this case, uh, it takes, for example, it might take me as a human, uh, you know, a few minutes, five minutes to write out the, if that's slow, uh, five minutes to write out the theme of happy birthday. Uh, but it might take me, you know, 10 hours to write it a hundred times for an entire symphony orchestra. However, the AI might be able to do it in seconds. So we wanted to find out, okay, if we feed it these certain styles, melodies, rhythms, what's going to come out on the other end? And we found out. So with iDragon, we have a little key at the beginning of the video. It shows you that uh, the green sections are parts that are uniquely uh, uh, created by the AI. And it created some unique shapes and rhythms that I never would have imagined to write for certain instruments. And then we have a second section, which is purple, which is things that the human, myself, Dana Leong, uh, put in to the computer using samples and rhythms and, you know, uh, uh, kind of like, you know, hip hop and more kind of popular styles of, of composing and producing. And then the last part is the blue, which is human recorded material. And so I hope you will enjoy, uh, you know, the sights and sounds uh, from my backyard here in Nagano, Japan with iDragon. I was like, I want to rock out, I want to rock out. 
Yeah. So, <laughs> you you're you're playing so many different instruments on there. I don't think you even showed all the ones that you're playing. So yeah, time to film. Yeah, everything. very impressive. <laughs> I know, and it's cold. It was yeah. spectacular <laughs> energy. Thank you so much. Um, and so the um, the final piece, the final world premiere we have is by composer Michael Abels. And it's interesting for me to be working with Michael because just on Saturday, we had a world premiere in a virtual concert I did. I played a piece called Isolation Variation. And so I've been working with Michael on a solo violin piece. But at the same time, Michael has been working on this piano work for um, for this project. And I really was interested in working with Michael for this project because he has all this experience working with film and also classical symphonic work and smaller ensembles. And Michael, you're a pianist by training. And so we wanted to bring piano into the mix because it's a different set of challenges to write for. It's two staves as opposed to for violin it's it's one line but for piano it's two staves ostensibly <laughs> and two hands and 10 fingers whereas on violin or orchestra it's like a completely different setup so the piano brings its own set of challenges also for ai but um michael is great at um really identifying the the moment and the mood and the thing that is needed musically to tie together the composer's intention and the audience's experience. And also Michael, your writing is really expressive. So it's it's fascinating for me to kind of look at that combination and how does that work with AI. Uh, the pianist for this performance is Dominic Cayley. And uh, it, was, it was interesting because as it turns out, Dominic is based in LA as well. So it's nice through this project to be able to connect people who are kind of in each other's backyards and also connect people who are globally related in different ways. Would you like to talk about the piece a little? Sure. Uh, first of all, it's so inspiring to see everyone's work. I'm, I'm just having so much fun. And I, uh, I, I guess what I'm struck by is how working with, a, with, working with a technology is like working with any tool is that when you're an artist is that you first have to understand how the tool works and what its capabilities are. And then you have to figure out how that can, how what the tool can do can best help you do what you do. And I think each of us composers kind of took an approach that also reflects how we look at music or how we think we're able to construct it. And, and you see, it, just in seeing the pieces we came up with, you see it illustrated really, really well. It's very interesting. So for me, um, I, I think I use the same uh, AI technology that uh, Dana used, um, which which he did so amazingly, by the way. That was and that was a wonderful piece and a, and a really great introduction to it. Um, I was like, hmm, okay, what does this do? And so I saw that the AI had. Um, was able to generate music just you buy a series of drop down menus and you make choices of genre of music and instrumentation and key and whether it's fast or slow things like that and you hit generate and music appears and so i thought but and so i thought so i tried that out and i heard some of the music it wrote in different genres and thought hmm i didn't know what to do but then i saw that you could you could upload influences you could upload something and have it be influenced by that and i thought well that's cool because I wonder what the AI thinks my style is. <laughs> I, I wanted to see what the AI, how the AI would think that I, what it, what it got out of my music. So I took another piano piece I'd written that was short and I uploaded it. And then I told it, it says, okay, now, you know, generate music based on this influence. I'm like, okay, generate that, you know? And you, so I had it generate a few pieces that it considered to be influenced by me. And uh, there were some ways in which I think I would agree that it was influenced by me. And other ways I was just like, Really, <laughs> but you know, that's the beauty of artistic interpretation. How is that different than any other person who hears a piece of music and feels like it's, you know, if that piece sounds like, you know, like like the Serengeti to you, who is someone else to tell you that it's not, you know? So just as the, the AI gave me an interpretation of music by me, and I thought that was really interesting. So I listened to that music and I've, 
I, I thought that some of its ideas, if we want to say it, these were ideas, were, were intriguing and others were not intriguing to my ear. So this was me interpreting the AI's work. And, it, the, and also I feel like, so there's a lot of ideas and I took a couple that I, really struck me as like, hey, I like this. <laughs> <laughs> this this feels like me, you know, and so I took those ideas and I used them to construct the piece and then but then also the, the music the AI generated was for piano sound, but it was not pianistic, meaning it was not idiomatic of the piano. It was if you looked at the sh at the written out notes of the music, it was playable, but you would need a at least two pianos and two or three players to play everything it had written. <laughs> all at once the way it was presenting it. And a part of what we do as composers is not only write what we hear, or in, ultimately, you know, it, composing is a spiritual thing. You want to be able to just transcribe the music that is already there, kind of. That's the, the zone I like to be in. We're not always there, but we try to. Anyway, um, so what I, what I did was I took some of its ideas that I liked and I, had, I made them idiomatic, and then I expanded on them in ways that a composer would. And so out of that, out of two specific ideas, um, I constructed this piece and I called it Gift of the Machine because there you go. So please enjoy um, Gift of the Machine performed by Dominic uh, Chaley. Also notice that Dominic um, 
it, everyone is multi-talented. He also performed as the pianist and the editor of this video. So thank you, Dominic. I know you're out there watching as well. He's yeah, a, everyone, everyone worked so hard on this project. I am so grateful to everyone here. I'm not sure the viewers understand how many hours went into all of this work and this experimenting and this presenting of ideas. And I really am grateful for this artistic effort. And, and then, beautiful piece, Michael. <laughs> I, I've been listening to it and enjoying and just enjoying hearing it all week, <laughs> not playing it, but just hearing it. It's like really, really nice to, to hear these different results. I don't know if Carol, you want to jump in with any any thoughts, or um, if we should maybe go to the discussion, or what? How do you, yeah. what do you want to do? Yeah, I, mean, I think it, it's fantastic because each of the composers um, took such a different approach with how they um, they wanted to compose with AI, whether it just inspired, whether it was literal notes. Um, so it would be great to you know switch gears now after we've heard these three beautiful pieces to talk to the composers now that we have them and it's fresh on our mind, like let's dive deep and ask them some, some questions um, and, and get to the bottom of their process and what they felt, the highs and the lows and, and all of this. So um, Hillary, do you want to kick off the first question here? Sure. Um, first of all, I just wanted to acknowledge that this is, these are unusual times and I wanted to see how you're all doing in your, in your work these days in general. Anyone want to participate first? <laughs> I have an entire series on my Instagram, uh, hashtagged lockdown got me like, and it's just like hilarious pet fails and, you know, cars with wings that can't fly and crash. And <laughs> But all, all jokes aside, you know, I think everybody's had to make uh, pivots and parallels, right? And flexibility you know, as Bruce Lee would say, uh, you know, is the key to your strength, like water, right? Water can strike, water can flow, water can be soft. And so through our flexibility, uh, we have found, uh, you know, that, that certain parts of our business may be paused, uh, but time goes on. The song keeps playing. When we unpause that song of 2020, unfortunately, it may be over. So uh, for us, particularly, we've... Uh, uh, you know, we built this production facility uh, with the idea that artists would be able to come from all over the world. Artists like yourselves are still invited. And once the doors of the borders are open, please come. Uh, however, because we cannot have uh, any substantially large events and we can't really invite international artists to come and record and live and you know, enjoy this region of the world, uh, we've really uh, boned up on... Uh, more of licensing mu music for games, music for TV, music for, uh, you know, virtual conferences even need theme songs. Everything, you know, needs music as the world uh, continues on. So uh, that's sort of what has happened in our world, uh, partially because uh, I'm not sure how everyone else feels. I'm, I'm very curious about this all the time, but uh, it felt to me that virtual performances a lot of the time were not as uh, engaging both for the performer, but also the audience. So uh, rather than uh, delve into that sort of uh, half-heartedly. I wanted to do something that would keep our teams of, uh, of composers and producers and artists uh, more engaged uh, and in their kind of authentic space of creating something that still uh, gives an emotional impact, uh, but also puts the creators in a space of comfort as well. How about you, Michael? Anything changed? <laughs> well, Composing for ensembles um, is, in some ways, the original uh, socially distant uh, profession, <laughs> I think. So that part has been great. And because uh, in the studio, in, the, in this, see, see this environment, this is my life. And that's, uh, and so that part has been, that's the part I'm used to. But it's still, uh, we all need to go outside and experience life. And when I do that, and I... I see the the changes in our world. It's it, it it's it's profound, and it's you, ha, uh, you as an artist, you can't help but respond to the the way that your environment feels, you know. Um, but I've also been blessed with a lot of work, um, and that and it just makes me aware 
of it's a year when I've been, uh, I, I've, so many people are suffering and I'm healthy and I have exciting, meaningful work. And I just feel very, very, very blessed. Um, and I feel blessed while I feel the injustice and everything that is going on around us. And it's, it's, especially those two things together, I'd never imagined myself in that situation. So, um, it's unusual and I can't wait for, um, I can't wait for this chapter to be behind us. David, I remember uh, talking to you while you were kind of stuck somewhere and um, your schedule had completely changed and everything was kind of up in the air. How, I, I don't know if you would have been able to work on this project if your schedule hadn't changed, but well, every, everything I was supposed to do got changes. canceled or postponed. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden I was, you know, free to um, do whatever you wanted me to do. Um, but I, I think what you say, Michael is really right. I think this is the, I mean, we're, we're composers. So actually our, um, like our best feature is spending a lot of time by ourselves. And so there's some, there's a way in which, um, you know, the pandemic has made us um, uh, do more of what we should be doing anyway. You know, it's like we should be spending more time working, but it also has brought out the incredible inequality of our um, ability to work while other people can't, you know, the, our ability to, to live, um, you know, like this kind of hiding is the way that we normally work as composers, you know. Um, so the weirdest thing for me about, about the pandemic, I have to say professionally, is that um, I've gotten a huge amount done because there wasn't much else to do. So I wrote an opera, I wrote a film score, I, I've, I've written a lot of music. Um, but what's interesting also is that we're all... Um, you know, that we, we have this whole package of what we like about being musicians, right? We get to write music, hear music, work with people, rehearse, travel, record. I mean, there's so many things that we do, and we, we never think about those things independently. We never go, okay, well, actually, of all the things that we could be doing, you know, it's like, now I can't do that, and I can't do that, and I can't do that. And it's been kind of interesting to find out the things that I really miss, you know, and the thing that I really miss the most is traveling around the world and meeting people I don't know and, um, and using music as a way to um, have conversation with them. And, um, and I, I'm not sure that without the pandemic, I would have thought that that was so important for me, that that's the thing that I miss the most. Great. Now, about kind of a follow-up question. Um, David, you, you touched on this, but I mean, you know, I would love to hear how you would describe your creative process and maybe one surprising thing about how working with AI changed that or brought some sort of insight. I'd love to hear from all the panelists on that, just well, like I'll what your normal start, creative I'll process. I'll just start, you know, I mean, my, uh, and then um, we'll get to the others, but um, I, um, I think of all these pieces, all, everything I do normally is like problem solving. Like you think, wouldn't it be great if a, uh, uh, the piece I wrote for you, Hillary, wouldn't it be great if the, you know, the, the violin just never stops and the um, kind of um, the context for the violin changes based on what the piano does, which is almost nothing. And so it's like these tiny little things that the piano does tell us how to listen to what this um, violin is doing constantly. And, um, and so they're like little musical problems. And so I looked at the AI as being like that as well, you know. How do you build a situation where you're um, you're fair to both sides, where you don't want to cheat, where you um, you want to actually honor both um, worlds, the human and the artificial? And then it was just like trying to figure out a way to do it. But the the thing is that I, as I think that you know, um, it, it, as Dana and Michael both said, you know, it's like we got the AI, the AI proposed things to us. And then we use our aesthetic ability to, um, and our intuition and our years of experience to um, filter it and change it and decide what pleased us. So there is a way in which fundamentally it's not like um, we're letting the AI tell us what its taste is. We're letting it give us more options for what our, to discover what our taste is. 
So, um, so maybe in the future we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll have a more equal way of doing that, or we'll just be better at following orders or something. But for now, it's like, it's, it's about us and our aesthetics. Where do you normally get your aesthetic cues? Um, like, is it just I, stuff that comes up in your head? Or? It's, it's <laughs> just a bunch of reading and thinking and listening. And I, I have, um, lots of ridiculous ideas, which, um, amuse me and, you know, I mean, really, it's like being a composer is, is figuring out how to spend a lot of time by yourself. And so that kind of, you know, um, you know, weird amusement is, is sort of how I get through it. Thanks, David. And, um, Michael and Dana just wanted to hear, like, where you guys get your inspiration regularly. And did the AI help or was it harder <laughs> to, to work with? Was it a good collaborator? Did it inspire you? Well, <laughs> I did a great job of uh, sort of summing up, uh, you know, what what kind of partnership uh, mm -hmm. and be possible between humans and AI. Uh, I looked at it from a very utilitarian uh, standpoint in that uh, I wanted to see how it can uh, sort of optimize the process of creating music, especially from a, a standpoint of, you know, music as a function in within a job, right? If you're a composer that needs to create music for, you know, a commercial or a game or, uh, you know, uh, some, some where, where it's, where it serves some maybe supportive function or film, right? Perhaps I think that, uh, because of the ability to kind of pump out, uh, in an expedient fashion, more music uh, without repetition. That is something that, you know, the machine still beats the human. So I think in terms of bringing something like this, which is turnkey to the masses, such as the Ava platform that uh, Michael and I use, I think that it could be useful for, you know, independent uh, creators who may not have substantial musical training, but they're able to describe the music they would like to hear or create or have in their in their projects. Uh, those who may need uh, original music layer uh, in qu in quantity, uh, but they don't want it to be repetitive, such as a filmmaker or game designer, right? Sometimes there's hours and hours and hours of gameplay, and they may not want the music to, or a film, and they may not want the music to actually repeat. They want it to kind of evolve with the journey. Um, and then anyone who's interested, uh, lastly, anyone who's interested to gain further perspective on a particular composer's style, Right. Uh, I believe somebody earlier uh, brought up the idea of you know, kind of self image and, uh, you know, the AI actually giving you a sort of critique or a mirror of what it believes your stylistic creative process is. And so that that's another way you could actually use to dissect other composers and kind of see what kind of uh, what kind of techniques repeat and what kind of things show up. Uh, while, throughout the creative process that maybe you wouldn't have been uh, e uh, easily able to actually see yourself. That's great. Yeah. It does seem like it can, like AI's strength is to pull out patterns. And so even if um, it might reflect some of your own salient patterns that you fall into and reflect that back to you. So, great. Thanks. Both those answers were very complete. I mean, I really <laughs> <laughs> And I, but maybe the only thing I could add is just that you, it, in some ways, it's like any other collaborator in that it has, it, it offers up something and your assignment is to collaborate. And so you look at what there is and what the possibilities are and what, you, what is being offered. And um, in, in the case of my piece, I like, I've never, there's, there are parts of it that are like a three part invention. And I've never written a three-part, as far as I'm concerned, the AI suggested that that's what that was because there, in a lot of what the AI did, there seemed to be three parts. I don't know why. <laughs> that was not necessarily true in what I fed it. <laughs> but nonetheless, I thought, okay, I'm going with that. And then there was, a, there was a riff, this cascading kind of arpeggio that was in three of the five pieces that I had it generate. I don't know why. But that's the, that's the beauty of like creativity. Like you have an idea. Why do you have that idea? That's not that's not the answer. The answer is not why. The answer is what can you do with that idea? 
And so I decided if the AI is this interested in this riff, <laughs> I'm going to use it. <laughs> like that's an important creative idea that it had and we're going to go with it. So um, these were things that I wouldn't have done if I was not collaborating with the AI. So, um, and I have no idea if I were to collaborate again, I have no idea what, what direction that journey would take, but that is the nature of collaboration. Um, the, the, the combination of two different minds creates something that wouldn't have happened if it was just a, a singular mind. So. Yeah. Well, I have a, I think we're almost out of time for the, for the panel, but um, I'm curious if anyone has, thoughts like towards the future, what ideals and challenges do you see AI representing? I'd love to know what popped up for you in the course of this. Anyone have ideas? Mm -hmm. I, Should I well, call you guys out? <laughs> I, I mean, to, so uh, artificial intelligence and creativity for composers can be an intimidating thing because there you, uh, given that, quality of artistic expression is totally subjective. Um, one wonders if AI could replace humans in generating music and doing it faster and better than, hum than humans ever could. And uh, that's an intimidating thought. But I think that the, the thing for, but you know, technology has always threatened humans as it has evolved through centuries. And there have been two minds. There's always been the mind of this is awesome and the mind of this is going to end everything as we know it, shut it down, you know. And <laughs> it doesn't matter. You pick a, pick a field and the shut it down people have never won <laughs> because technology advances. The people who have benefited are the people who embrace it and figure out how it can enhance their lives. And so I think that, you know, AI is something that's going to be more and more present in our lives. And we are going to embrace it and figure out how it's going to enhance creativity. And our definition, I think, of creativity is ultimately going to expand. And we just don't know what ways that's going to be. But as artists, we get to help create what that is. And so um, that's my answer. Yeah, really, I, I do like that point because it everything that evolves presents new challenges. Everything that arrives that has the chance to influence human expression also has a chance to change it. And um, it's not always easy to look at the changes that may be coming and be on board with those changes. Um, I see you nodding, Dana, and I feel like, David, you have some things you would probably want to add. <laughs> Any quick thoughts? Well, I just want to follow up on Michael. I think that's really true that people are going to eventually will be figured out. And I think we're at the beginning right now where we um, used the AI to figure out how it will help us be the people we want to be. And I think the question that people need to start asking is, um, what is the kind of thing that the AI wants to do, which it could do better? Um, so um, right now, we all made the kind of music that we like to make already. So, And I think the interesting thing would be to try to figure out how to make a kind of music we don't know exists yet. And um, since we can't figure that out yet, we're not there. But um, I, I suspect what will happen is we'll get there. Great. Yeah, because I mean, oh. <laughs> electric, uh, yeah, electricity really helped create all these electronic instruments. And now we have genres that are new, like EDM and these new type of artists or people who are at home creating content or creating music that probably might not have access to that as well. So, um, I think there's different ways that technology can help enhance our lives. You know, I'm sorry, you were about to say something. All, all good. I, I think, uh, Hillary, your question was about what are the challenges, the impotent, the impeding challenges coming. Uh, you know, I don't want to be the, uh, the speaker of doomsday or whatnot, but, you know, with every new kind of platform technology, there's always a new set of rules. Uh, we sat in with uh, with Jared Cohen and uh, Eric Schmidt after they wrote a book on digital technology and uh, uh, and AI uh, security after they visited North Korea and they said you know there's a, there's going to have to be a f full new set of laws that out that roll out for digital crime right? for example if one country logs into the bank accounts of another and steals all the all the currency there currently isn't a repercussion or a law or a punishment that's suited to 
to deal with that kind of uh, activity. And so, you know, when you apply that to AI and creativity, there will have to be new rules of copyright. There will have to be new rules of liability. What happens if the AI copies something that was written by someone else? Who's liable at that point, right? I, I think, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a hairy game already, and I, I don't want to be anywhere near, you know, intellectual property lawsuits of any sort, but we know it will, it will, it will emerge. And the second is uh, the delusion of reality. Right. I hate, again, I don't want to go into doomsday here, but, you know, we've got things like beauty cam, which is, you know, which can basically give you digital plastic surgery with, you know, a selfie on a cell phone. And, you know, folks like the Kardashians are, are, you know, evangelists and they are sponsors of things like this. And, you know, it, it is something that, that brings a lot of self image distortion into the world and a lot of uh, self image issues that a lot of people strive, uh, forces people to strive for unrealistic, uh, unrealistic expectations and goals. And so, you know, it would be sad to get to a point where people don't know the difference between you know, a Bach invention and something that was pressed on a button and sounds similar, but maybe it doesn't have that, you know, perfect uh, kind of counterpo- counterpointal uh, uh, architecture. Uh, maybe, maybe it doesn't have that, you know, that kind of simplicity and, and beauty of, of, of a perfect melody, but people may not know. Right? because they will forget the history. Uh, one friend of mine who's a quite well-known rapper in New York said his heart broke when he went to a show and he saw a, a father and son uh, at, the, at the edge of the stage and the, and the son pointed to the drum set and said, Dad, what, what is that? And he said to his son, you know, that's what they used to make beats on. Oh, that's so sad. Oh. <laughs> Delusion of reality. Yeah. Yeah, I think all of and on this, that, all of this stuff should be talked about. I, that's why we're that's why we're here. Like, I think the fear comes from not talking about things like this and not facing the challenges and not outlining the ideals. So, in a field that is so highly creative and so individual, like all the artists have such a bond with our self expression. And the idea that that may be changed in the perception of society is definitely something that is a, it is a concern, but I think as we, as we proceed through it, as the technology arrives, which it is arriving and it's happening already, um, if, if artists such as ourselves can be speaking with people on the AI side and really having these conversations may be versions of AI can evolve that are informed um, and that have grown out of intelligent conversation about, about the arts and AI. But uh, yeah, any innovation brings with it a whole new set of challenges. The flip side <laughs> of that may, may be that it actually may reinforce for us the things that um, are um, completely human because we are more able to identify the things that artificial intelligence can't do. And then because they are things which are reserved just for us, then they um, can have more nobility because we are the only ones who can do them. I, th- I think that's, that's great, David. I think that, that point is really important. And I think we're, it, it's early days in the AI going into the creative realm. And I do think that these conversations um, highlight the importance of a shared set of values that might um, be among artists globally. And I think it's important to call out, you know, what what AI should do, what AI can't do, and just be more transparent with the process as we move forward, because it's not a question of, you know, if AI is coming, because it's almost, it's already here. It's more just like, how do artists want to uh, use their voice to help shape the future of AI. So it's not just AI shaping artists, it's also the other way around. And I think this is a feedback loop and um, hopefully we can continue um, this project that can help shape what the future of creativity could look like or that both of them can coexist and also become even more creative or um, new genres of music as as one of you brought up. Um, 
we really want to thank you all who have joined us this evening, both the, all three of the composers for their time performing the piece, writing their artistic statements, which are um, on the web. We'll be sharing the videos, um, all the artists, all the audience that are they're, they're participating. And I saw you guys actively chatting. This is such a special time in, in history, uh, a very unique time. And we're really glad that um, people from both both industries of AI and art can join us this evening. Um, I've really enjoyed it. Uh, Hillary, uh, thank you very much for, for your time also thinking and, and bringing everyone together. Yeah, I would just like to thank everyone. As Carol, as Carol said, it's, it's really, I think it's super unique to be here doing this project at this time. I can't think of a time and space in which this could have happened this way. And it's due to all these different influences along the historical timeline of these fields and also this global pandemic and also just all of us being connected with each other. It's it's really a, a special moment. And I'm so glad all of you on the panel could join. And I'm really glad all of the audience could join. Um, so yeah, we're gonna, if everyone wants to stick around and hear the three pieces back to back, we're going to recap with uh, David Lang's piece, Out of Body, um, Dana Leung's piece, I Dragon, and Michael Apel's piece, Gift of the Machine. Um, I'm really appreciative of all of the time and dedication you composers have poured into these works, and I'm proud of this project's potential to positively impact the future. Thank you. after you've heard from the composers and it changes your perspective of how the pieces are, um, how you interpret that music. Okay. All right. Or your perspective of who the heck the composer actually is. <laughs> oh, yeah. Not the people just hiding out in caves. <laughs> All right, here we go.
did you um, film it? Was it through drones or was it one drone? Or It looked like quite a production there. And I, I love the fast piece edits as well. It's a production of one. Wow. Uh, wow. <laughs> drones you can now actually pre-program to do certain movements. So I've been practicing with it all year. So luckily I was able to have some things oh. programmed, ready to ready to. And I had kind of the shot list in my mind because we only have a few hours of daylight here in Japan right now in the mountains. So I was watching yesterday and I said, okay, now <laughs> it was three o'clock and the sun goes down at four 30. And I said, all right, we have time to get out there with two instruments. What melodies are the most important to cover? The cello and the trumpet, which I learned in five days just to get this video and music done. <laughs> wow. Dedication. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. <laughs> See you soon. Good night or good morning. Bye. <laughs> <laughs>